So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Daniel Segre. Uh, Daniel is a professor of biology, biomedical engineering, and physics, and a core faculty member in the bioinformatics graduate program at Boston University. He's a member of the Biological Design Center and founding director of the Boston University Microbiome Initiative. So uh, Daniel's research spans a number of different areas, but essentially is using mathematical models to describe networks of interactions in everything from biochemical networks to um, microbial communities. And I, I would just like to mention that, um, that Daniel's um, study many years back on the evolution of biochemical networks uh, before and after the Great Oxidation Event. This was a paper that came out, I think, in the early 2000s with uh, Jason Raymond. I remember when I read that paper um, back, uh, back when I was just getting started here at Rutgers, it was tremendously influential in helping me understand the connections between metabolism and uh, molecular evolution. And I think if there's anyone who's going to be able to give us insight into how to understand what's going on within our networks, it's going to be uh, coming from ideas that um, Daniel and their group is developing. So, Daniel, thank you very much for joining us today. We're looking forward to hearing your work. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I really would have enjoyed visit, visiting in person, but this is still great. Um, and thanks for the introduction. And uh, so um, I'll start just by saying that most of the work I'm going to present today is really work that was done by Josh Golford. Um, a former student from my lab who recently graduated. I think he's here online as well. And Hyman Hartman, uh, who sparked a lot of conversations that uh, really were influential in uh, generating a lot of the work I'm going to present. Um, so, let's see. Oh. Um, so we, we're, and, and this is a perfect segue uh, to, to uh, what we just heard. And I think, you know, it's natural to think of fossils and uh, traces of ancient life in rocks and in genomes. One can look for phylogenetic signals of ancient life. And as we just heard in protein folds as well, um, what we've been doing in the past few years, and in fact, it started with this uh, work with Jason several years back, is to think of whether we can look for fossils of ancient life in metabolic networks, uh, meaning really in the architecture of metabolism, in, you know, asking how this network that we see today came about and whether we can read it in such a way to try and infer some of the uh, its early history. And I should say most of the work that we do in my lab right now is really focused on looking at metabolism today. So we ask this question of how organisms today allocate their resources to be able to produce their biomass components and generate new cells. So what you see here is a histogram of the uh, biomass composition of an E. coli cell uh, dominated by amino acids uh, and a number of other molecules we're all familiar with. Uh, and the question we ask with these models is how, how can uh, the regulation of metabolism lead to uh, an appropriate allocation of all, the, all these different resources in order to allow a cell to produce accurately its own biomass composition. Uh, and in fact, this is dealt with by different types of modeling approaches, most of, uh, you, you may be familiar with this idea of flux balance analysis. This is a constraint-based model that allows you to take the whole metabolic network of a cell in post conditions about the incoming fluxes of uh, key elements and asking how will metabolism uh, appropriately produce the different biomass components. And it turns out this is a problem that can be solved mathematically using linear programming very efficient, efficiently to look at the steady state um, um, capacity of metabolism to really uh, produce a balanced amount of the different um, bricks necessary for new cells. And in thinking about this problem, we got more and more uh, interested also in the question of how multiple organisms interact with each other and asking this question of whether it's possible to, in fact, use this genome scale models of metabolism to predict ecology, to understand not just what happens inside each cell, but also understand how cells interact with each other, for example, through competition for common resources or exchange cross-feeding um, of metabolites that may be secreted by one organism and used by another. So there is a lot of work which I'm not going to talk about today. And one thing I want to point out is that there is 
uh, software we built, we call comets, computational microbial ecosystems in time and space um, that allows one to model microbial community metabolism in, a, in, a, in an efficient way. Uh, but the reason I'm mentioning this is that as part of this process, we also started thinking of whether it matters in a microbial community, in an ecosystem, which organisms perform which reaction. Um, and, and somehow with the advent of metagenomic sequencing, we tend to think of metabolism as an ecosystem level property. And, and this idea of metabolism and ecosystem level property uh, is actually quite relevant also for asking questions about the ancient life uh, with the idea that perhaps the, um, the set of uh, reactions that we see in organisms today may have changed um, substantially throughout the history of life horizontal gene transfer, addition of new reactions, and so on. So we start using more and more this approach of an ecosystem level um, way of looking at ancient metabolism. And the question then becomes not necessarily what an organism can do with its own metabolic network, but what can, what can an ecosystem do with its metabolic network? So we went back uh, to looking at the whole metabolic network of um, the union of all metabolic reactions across all living systems represented here in the classical Berger chart, which one can now download from multiple databases, including TEG and others, and ask questions about the early history of metabolism. Um, and what allows, allowed us to do this uh, in the first place is an algorithm that is very simple and which I'm gonna describe now very quickly, uh, which is the algorithm that was used in this early paper with uh, Jason Raymond. Um, and the idea is the following. If you look at a network, and this is a tiny representation of a whole metabolic, uh, the, the, uh, the, the whole keg network I, you just saw. Um, and the question we're asking is whether given uh, a set of initial compounds, what other compounds in this network can be reached by walking across the different reactions that are, uh, that are present in metabolism. This was developed um, several years ago by Oliver Ebenhoch and Rainer Heinrich's group. Um, to study the structure of metabolic networks. So the idea is the following. Imagine you start with a set of compounds, which we call seed, and now that you have these two uh, metabolites, you can ask which reactions are feasible. Uh, you don't ask about the presence, absence of catalysts or enzymes, just in terms of the topology of the network, what is feasible. And it turns out, in this case, of course, this reaction can proceed, so you'll add these two um, products to the network. And in this case, uh, the, the algorithm will end because there are no more reactions possible. This reaction cannot proceed because we don't have this additional metabolite. So the end product, the final set of all metabolites that can be produced is what is called the scope of this expansion process and gives us an idea of what metabolites can be produced given the initial seed. Uh, of course, if you add this additional metabolite in the seed set, then uh, this other reaction can proceed and the scope will be in this case, the whole network. So one can ask a say, the same question for the large network, where of course it's much less trivial to figure out visually what might happen. So you can take a set of initial compound from uh, the whole collection of known metabolic reactions um, and ask what metabolites are in principle possible by doing these iterations of expansion given this initial set of compounds. And in fact, the, our first uh, exploration using this algorithm was this work with Jason Raymond, which I'm summarizing here in one slide, where we asked the question of um, how metabolism at the ecosystem level would have expected to change um, uh, due to the uh, presence of oxygen accumulating uh, upon the um, great oxidation event. So what happened here was that we asked what was the, what uh, did the network look like before and after adding oxygen as one of the seed metabolites in the expansion. And what you see here in blue is the anoxic network and in red, the extra reaction that became available because of the availability of oxygen. And this gave rise to additional branches in metabolism, including production of flavonoids, sterols, the terpenoids and, and other molecules, somehow showing that there was significant biosynthetic capacity that was enabled by opening this new uh, possibilities through the availability of oxygen. And in fact, for many years, we didn't really think uh, a lot about uh, this expansion, but I had always in the back of my mind uh, the idea that perhaps one could go backwards in time even more. And the opportunity to revisit this algorithm and ask this question arose uh, when in fact, uh, I was, uh, I had, there was an encounter between myself, uh, um, uh, Josh and uh, Goldford and Hyman Hartman, and we started discussing uh, 
the phosphate problem. So this question that uh, that is uh, uh, an important question in the, the history of early life of how um, a phosphate that is mostly locked in in uh, minerals um, prior to the to the to the emergence of life, and and we know that phosphate is a limiting resource, as you can see here from uh, an example of eutrophication, where um, communities will bloom when uh, phosphate is made available. So there is uh, often a limitation of phosphate in microbial communities. And the question is, uh, could we use this network expansion algorithm as a way of asking how metabolism could have looked like early on? And in fact, is it possible that early life may, an early metabolism at least, may have uh, had a period of time evolving prior to the um, availability of phosphate. Um, so we were not, of course, the first to think about this possibility. Um, Christian de Duve had hypothesized an, a thioester world where uh, thioester would, uh, bonds would provide the primitive energy currency. This is an example of acetyl-CoA, um, very important molecule in metabolism today. And a subset of, the, of this molecule, pantothene, um, that actually is is not involving phosphate could have been an early version of uh, this coenzyme, and this is the thioester bond. So um, the question is how to use uh, the network expansion to address this question. And when we first thought about this, the intuition was that without phosphate, nothing could really happen. Um, if you think of metabolism today, there are a lot of reactions that depend on ATP, um, and of course, uh, NADP and NAD, and there are a number of other molecules that uh, that obviously contain phosphate, uh, including, of course, uh, nucleotides. So if we're talking about an early metabolism prior to phosphate, this would be a world uh, that, that would not depend on genetic material and would just be a purely metabolic uh, kind of um, uh, process. So. We're very, very skeptical initially on whether indeed uh, we could find a network uh, in within metabolism that would not depend on phosphate. So what Josh did was to take um, as a seed set, a set of um, plausible early uh, biosphere um, metabolites. Uh, so some fixed carbon, but really mostly very simple molecules you can, that you see listed here, hydrogen sulfide, um, ammonia, and uh, but no phosphate. And the question is, if you start with the seed set, would you would be able to see the expansion to a network uh, that is really non-trivial? Um, and again, my expectation when we first started doing this was that nothing would be possible without the presence of phosphate. But we were very surprised when we saw the expanded network that you see here, uh, which we call the, we call the core, a core um, phosphate-independent network. And this is a network that starts uh, somewhere here with this blue metabolites during the expansion process uh, through the iterations you build up these additional metabolites adding these green uh, molecules and ending with the orange ones and this network counts 260 metabolites 315 reactions it's a fully connected network that is completely uh, does not contain any phosphate containing molecule uh, this contains i think 10 amino acids um, a large number of TCA cycle intermediates, a lot of the key molecules of central carbon metabolism. And, um, and we were very surprised to see this and, and somehow puzzled. Because again, this, you know, we don't know. And, and one of the key questions is, of course, whether really this represents an early metabolism. But what is definitely true is that there is uh, such a network embedded in this, um, uh, in this, collection of metabolic net, uh, metabolic reactions pre, uh, known today, there is a core network that is independent of phosphate. So this was quite interesting. Uh, and Josh had the idea of uh, trying to connect this to what we know today about these enzymes um, in, in order to figure out whether we could uh, find an independent evidence for the po possible ancient nature of this core network. And one idea was to uh, look at each of these reactions that, again, in, in this hypothetical pre-phosphate world would be uh, um, a set of reactions that are not yet catalyzed, at least not, you know, by, by, uh, by, by fully, um, fully made enzymes and by uh, genetic-backed system, but, um, but we can look at the reactions that catalyze 
the, sorry, the enzymes that catalyze these reactions today and look at specific properties of these reactions and in particular at whether they have cofactors that are indicative of ancient life. And here I'm venturing into territory that is very close to your topic of research and that many of you know much more than I do about. Um, but um, I will just show you one representative result. So what we did was to look at um, the cofactors present, some of the cofactors present in the enzyme of this core network and compare this to uh, the general presence of cofactors in the whole network. And what you can see here as one of the most representative results is that there was a very strong enrichment for iron sulfur clusters in the reactions that are part of this core network. So this is shown in this red bar here relative to um, the fully uh, expanded network, whether done aerobically or anaerobically, doesn't really matter. There was no major difference. The key difference was that in this core phosphate independent network, there was a high enrichment for this iron sulfur cluster clusters. Uh, there was enrichment for zinc as well. Um, no significant patterns for amino acid and uh, nucleotide content, um, although there, there is, if at all, an in inverse enrichment for nucleotide that is um, in, in, in presence more in the uh, fully expanded relative to the aerobic uh, network. Um, one problem which I want to highlight, which sparked uh, a, a different set of questions, was um, how to deal with the energetics of this. So in the network expansion algorithm I described, um, the process is a purely topological one. So you, you take the initial, end, uh, initial metabolites, you walk along the network, and you, you can reach any region of the network just based on whether or not uh, you have the reactant that are necessary uh, for, for a given reaction to proceed. But before, and in the traditional network expansion algorithm, there is no questions about thermodynamics. So of course, a lot of these reactions may be thermodynamically infeasible. I'm showing here an, you know, an example of a reaction that is driven by ATP hydrolysis. And if we don't have ATP because we have the phosphate independent network, then this reaction may not be able to proceed, may be energetically infeasible. And in fact, if you remove this, this um, if you add these uh, thermodynamic constraints to the network, uh, uh, the network expansion cannot proceed as we just saw. Uh, and to make a long story short, what ended up uh, re-enabling the network expansion was to uh, take some of the current coenzymes that are present in metabolism, such as acetyl-CoA, and just substitute them with what we uh, what are seem to be the ancient versions of these uh, cofactors. For example, for uh, coenzyme A, we could substitute this with pantothene, which is now an allowed um, metabolite because it does not contain phosphate. And again, we observe that the network expansion becomes viable and now is thermodynamically feasible in addition to being topologically feasible. So this was this was exciting, which was quite unexpected. And um, we, we realized uh, sure, uh, shortly after that, that in fact, we could ask using this uh, concept of thermodynamic expansion, we could add, ask even broader questions about um, how metabolism may have grown from an initial seed. And the idea um, is the following. So um, in addition to looking at metabolism as it is today, one could look at a variety of different possible initial conditions um, and ask whether different initial conditions um, about the, the primordial um, settings could have given rise to different types of network expansion. So as I just mentioned, when you add the thermodynamic constraints, you can, you're effectively asked, you're effectively setting uh, some expectations about the typical range of concentrations for metabolites. You know about the thermodynamic potential for each reaction, and you can compute the chance uh, that a given reaction can uh, move forward under those conditions. But one can generalize this, and in fact, we use uh, Ron Milaw's equilibrator to calculate uh, the free energy for um, uh, chemical for metabolic reactions in metabolism um, by taking into account also the pH, the temperature, uh, and uh, reduction potential of possible donor and acceptors that could be much more general than the ones that are present today in metabolism. So each of these different uh, shapes indicates the different types of conditions that one can look at, different electron donors, carbon sources, nitrogen sources, tile sources, pH, temperature, and reduction potential. And um, what 
what we did was substitute in metabolism um, for the known electron donor acceptors, some generic electron donor acceptors for which we could tune the reduction potential. And now instead of just assuming uh, the known reduction potential from uh, the cofactors today, we could choose arbitrary reduction potential and ask for each possible reduction potential whether a certain reaction is feasible and therefore how would this affect the expansion process um, of metabolism. And this is a map that summarizes these results and I recognize that this is complex to read so I'm not, I'm not expecting to uh, that look into all the details, but this is just, I want to just highlight um, the, the kind of how much information there is here. On the left column here, you can see uh, all the different initial conditions represented by these different colors. For example, uh, on in this column, you can look at the different uh, reduction potentials. The second column represent the pH, then you have temperature, and so on. And you can uh, you can look at all the different combinations and e for each possible combination of this initial condition, you can ask how would the network expansion look like? And in particular, which pathways would be represented in the expanded network shown with this different um, in the gray um, uh, scale columns here, this showed the coverage, the degree of coverage of different metabolic pathways. And I'm not going to go into all the details here, uh, but one figure here on the right that summarizes, summarizes a lot of the simulations shows the size of the expanded network, that is how many of these different conditions gave rise to really a negligible size network of the order of you know, a few reactions as opposed to a fully expanded network. So what you can see here, which is in itself interesting, is that there is a fairly binary um, set of conditions. That is, there are many conditions that do not lead to any significant expansion of metabolism, but then there are a lot of uh, conditions, a lot of possible combinations of these parameters, temperature, pH, and so on, that gives rise to fairly large expanded network of the order of 300 metabolites. So we looked um, at what is common between all, all of these uh, expanded networks, that is, which of the initial conditions seem to be crucial or the expansion of this network. And one thing that was quite surprising and somehow still uh, puzzling to me is the fact that nitrogen did, didn't seem to be one of the, uh, fixed nitrogen didn't seem one of the necessary conditions for reach this largest networks. So what this means is that a lot of these expanded networks could arise even in absence of fixed nitrogen. Uh, that is, there are networks largely composed of uh, this organosulfur compounds uh, which end up making a fairly large connected network similar to the one you saw before, uh, but potentially um, still lacking or independent of the presence of fixed nitrogen. Now, um, there is uh, a lot more details that I can go into here, but this is one possible representation of um, the core component of the metabolic network that seems to support this putative ancient metabolism. And um, one thing that is remarkable I want to emphasize about this is that we wouldn't have been able to find this network if we had looked at any individual organism. And I think this is to me one of the fascinating aspects of uh, doing this analysis is that we really look beyond the organismal level and uh, at, a, at an ancient world where maybe, you know, there were proto-organisms or just metabolic reactions happening in, in different regions in space, but somehow uh, there is, seems to be a lot of value in looking at metabolism uh, collectively because what could what might seem from this figure a proto-metabolic network is, uh, is a network that is not present in any individual organism today, but it's a puzzle of different components that uh, nowadays are present in different organisms. And I want to highlight, highlight also that um, there were some biopolymers that could be formed in this network, uh, uh, polyketides, fatty acids, uh, that are that gave us the idea of trying to use this model as a way to connect back to this concept of flux balance analysis that I mentioned early on and ask the question of whether we can use um, this putative early metabolism network to make a model of a protocell using the systems biology approaches that we use to study metabolism today. Uh, and this uh, last slide, I think, shows uh, 
uh, the an example of this. So similar to what we do when we study metabolism in E. coli, when we ask, okay, given uh, the availability of different compounds in the environment and uh, reaction network uh, and a set of known uh, building blocks that are necessary for building biomass, how, you know, is it possible to find a set of fluxes or metabolic fluxes that could sustain uh, continuous production of these building blocks? We can ask now the same question for a putative protocell where we can assume again the presence of specific electron donors and electron acceptors and uh, uh, carbon sources and so on and solve this problem of um, uh, flux balance in, in this uh, early cell asking now, for example, whether the cell, this, this uh, proto-metabolism could produce sustainably uh, polyketides and uh, fatty acids. And in fact, we found that there are several uh, conditions that allow this, and, and this is a little bit different, or actually substantially different from the question of whether the network can expand. This really starts asking questions about the dynamics and the, the feasibility of a sustainable um, kind of collectively autocatalytic set that can produce uh, all biomass components in this ancient version of biomass. And of course, this is just one example of many possible ways of, of uh, trying different proto-metabolic networks. Um, I really, I, I think we cannot say whether, you know, this reflects truly uh, the very early stages of metabolism and there are a lot of open questions, but I think that this idea of looking at networks distributed across organisms and starting to use some of these tools from systems biology to probe early metabolism uh, is a very, uh, very interesting way of addressing questions about uh, the evolution of metabolism. And I will stop here. I was just going to spend a minute to acknowledge again, uh, Joshua, I think I've already left in this figure, in this uh, image, uh, who really did most of this work, uh, Hyman and Temple Smith, and uh, all of our funding sources. And thank you all again for listening. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was a fascinating talk. Um, I'm just going to ask one of our uh, listeners now, Ji Hua, are you are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. What is the uh, what is the possibility that there was really very low phosphate in the early Earth? Um, it's quite possible um, because the 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 sea sea water, uh, you know the, the the only source, the big source of phosphorus for the early ocean is from continent weathering. And the continent uh, in the early Earth is very uh, small. So uh, it's, it's very likely that the phosphate is a limiting nutrient in the early ocean. But there was still had to have been some dissolved phosphate. I mean, was uh, all phosphate yeah. appetite or something? I mean, that was simply bound in rocks? Or minerals. And you you can have, you can have some like in very early uh, Earth you can have some phosphate uh, transported from the uh, meteorites and they are very reactive. They are actually reducing uh, phos phosphorus. Um, but uh, um, once uh, I think you have the um, magnetic field, then uh, I think the the extraterrestrial input is minimal. Um, okay, thank you. Well, free, phosph free phosphate uh, concentration would be very low, right? Because the, uh, the, the you know, any, any divalent metal uh, phosphate complex is insoluble, essentially, so. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, because the seawater will be enriched in um, calcium, magnesium, iron, and those divalent metals can, can form various kinds of uh, phosphate minerals. Yeah, and I'll add that I think extraction from apatite and other minerals today can happen from organic acids produced by microbes. But the, the, one of the problems is this, you know, how the bootstrapping of, of this whole process before life. You know, it's, it's a, an amazing situation. We, we can go back to Redfield in the 1930s, 1930. Six. I don't remember the exact date for the first Liverpool lecture, but then 1963, 58, uh, he wrote the papers. Um, 
So the limnologists always believed in phosphorus limitation, which is true for lakes. Um, but the ocean today, and probably for a very, very, very long time, has been nitrogen limited. And the reason it's nitrogen limited is, especially since the great oxidation event, uh, iron is, is not as freely available for nitrogen fixers. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating problem because nitrogenase is, contains 38 iron atoms. And it's the most uh, iron hoggish protein on the planet. So getting getting nitrogen to the system would have been hard, but I, I didn't realize that uh, you, we didn't ever have a, a nitrogen free world. Obviously, we always had some ammonia in some way, um, and there must have been some phosphate. But I mean, I, I really like the idea of the seed to make a core metabolism, and it reminds me of uh, uh, you know um, I mean obviously working with 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 high Hartman, but um, Morowitz. Yes, yes, thank you. Actually, I should have mentioned, of course, yes. Hey, just to chime in, we have a very uh, rich discussion on the chat. So there are many questions that may or may not be answered uh, in the time period that we have. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. So, uh, Kenneth, so we'll, we'll get to those, um, I think, hopefully, at the discussion time. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.